Morning, folks. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Welcome to the 2021 Conservation Summit. Um, before we get started, we're going to go over some virtual housekeeping real quick. So we've been kind of hands doing this already, but please check to make sure that your microphone is on mute at all times. During the presentation, um, please turn off your cameras as well. Um, and at, at the end of the presentation, we'll have time for a Q&A. It'd be great to see your faces then, so if you could turn your uh, camera back on at that point, that'd be great. Feel free to write questions in the chat during the presentation, um, and we will make sure that they get incorporated into the Q&A at the end. Um, during this Q&A session, it's helpful if you use the uh, reactions tool within Zoom to raise your hand. Um, we've already had some folks doing this, but if you haven't uh, already gone ahead and introduced yourself in the chat, uh, name and where you're from, any town boards that you serve on, that would be great uh, to go ahead and, and do that. So this summit is hosted by the Association of Vermont Conservation Commissions. Our mission is to support Vermont Conservation Commissions and empower the creation of new conservation commissions across Vermont. In addition to our annual summit, we have a 600 member listserv a tiny grants program, and a library of conservation success stories. These stories cover a huge range of conservation commission successes, from organizing a Green Up Day event to changing a town zoning. Be sure to read these good news stories on our website and submit your own story about the good work that your conservation commission does. The theme for this year's summit is caring for the land. This current session is On the Trail of Wildlife with a Vermont Master Naturalist and is presented by Alicia Daniel. I was fortunate enough to have the privilege of going on this very hike that you are all about to go on with Alicia last fall during one of my field naturalist graduate courses. Our hike last fall was one of the most memorable experiences of my time as a graduate student at the University of Vermont, and there's no better place to see the layer cake in which Alicia has so eloquently described about Vermont for years. Alicia described her greatest skill as being someone who pays attention to wildlife, remembering what she's seen and where she sees it, and adding layers of the story over time in these places. One of these special places is Raven Ridge, a natural area that Alicia has returned to for several, several years now since it was first conserved in 2010. Alicia is the field naturalist for Burlington Parks Recreation and Waterfront Department and the executive director and founder of the Vermont Master Naturalist Program. Before I turn it over to Alicia, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Special thanks to Front Porch Forum, the Hunger Mountain Co-op, the Nature Conservancy in Vermont, and the Vermont Land Trust for their contributions. We'd also like to acknowledge the Two Rivers Ottaquiche Regional Commission. Thanks so much, we couldn't do this without you all. <clears throat> now we'll begin and switch it over to Alicia. Thank you, Matt. That was a lovely introduction. And I guess what I'll say is we're, we're going to start on this hike where we're going out to Raven Ridge to look at signs of wildlife that have been pointed out to me or that I've noticed over the last 10 years out there. It's a beautiful spot right on the corner of Moncton and Charlotte and Hinesburg. It's right adjacent to uh, the, the river there, Lewis Creek. And there's a lot of wildlife activity in there. And so it's, it's a fun place to go and, and notice those signs. And after that, um, you know, I'd love it to be kind of a give and take discussion about the importance of wildlife habitat and, and what that means to us um, as a group. And also, if you're interested, uh, some of the work that I'm involved in in Burlington is through a group called Grow Wild. Uh, which is a partnership of many organizations, including Burlington Wildways. But we um, are trying to restore native plants to our habitat here in Burlington through uh, people's yards and public spaces. And, and that's a, a growing interest of mine, um, which is creating new habitat for everything from the foxes and the occasional bobcat we get in Burlington to the birds, the migratory birds and the insects that live here. So I guess, um, Jens, if you want to queue up the video, let's go on the hike and then we can all chat together. Hi, we 
we're here in the Champlain Valley as fall turns to winter. We're visiting Raven Ridge Natural Area, which is owned by the Nature Conservancy. And our goal today is to go out and look at wildlife habitat. The naturalist Greg Strebler described wildlife as whispers of thought through forests of time. It's hard to notice wildlife sometimes because they're avoiding us. Um, but winter allows us an opportunity to look for their tracks and also to visit their their houses. How are they getting through the winter? How do they survive in Vermont? So come with us and we'll go find what we find out there. I bet we'll have a good time. Here we are standing at the beaver pond here at the Raven Ridge Natural Area. And when we think about wildlife habitat, what are, what are animals seeking? They're seeking shelter, they're seeking food, they're seeking mates. And as we look at a beaver pond, you see kind of that coming together um, in one location where the beaver will cut down the hardwood trees, they'll eat the cambium, the inner bark, and they'll use the, the, the sticks for lodges, building their home, and also for building their dam to impound the water. They like to spend the winter under the water. They feel safer there. They're not, they're kind of awkward on land. And so they'll go underwater. They have food cached down there that they eat. They come up underwater into their lodge and that's how they get through the winter here in Vermont. One of the iconic signs that you're near a beaver pond are these uh, beaver chewed sticks. You know, they've carted off the shrub here and taken it for their lodge or for caching for food. And this chew pattern, which we're seeing in several places down here, is typical of, of beaver habitat. Here we have a rather large tree that's been cut. It's a hardwood that's been cut by beaver. This is a sign that the habitat is not ideal for them anymore. Normally this is a much larger tree than they would choose and in fact some of the stumps we were looking at earlier looked like they were white cedar. Uh, typically they prefer hardwoods. Usually beavers prefer the hardwoods they grew up eating so there's some evidence that they're faithful to their the food that they ate when they were little. As time goes on, and you it will look around the pond here, you see that the hardwoods start to be eaten out around the pond, and you end up with a coniferous ring of trees, a green ring around the pond. That's another sign that you're at a beaver pond. We're standing on the dam that the beavers built to impond the water behind us. Um, they like the water to be deep enough that it won't freeze solid in the winter because they live under that water. It's a little hard to make this dam out, but we can see the water lapping right up against it. And the dead trees that are in this pond are conifers that they didn't cut down as they were building the dam. So they died standing in place. And those, are, those snags are great habitat for things like great blue heron, which will nest up in the tops of these dead trees. We aren't seeing the classic um, cone-shaped lodge that's often in the middle of the pond, but we see sticks across the way that have clearly been stacked there by the weavers, and they may be in a bank lodge in this location. The pond will be here for a few years, 20 years maybe, and the beavers will abandon it, at least temporarily, and then it will return to meadow. And those, these beaver meadows are great for moose and other wildlife. The pond itself hosts abundance of, of wildlife, including green frogs and bullfrogs and red spotted newts. And so throughout the entire range of what this landscape will be when the beaver turned it into a pond until they let it go to meadow. Um, this is fantastic uh, habitat for other wildlife. As we think about this Raven Ridge natural area, we'll find the wetlands are in the lowlands. Of course, the water runs downhill. And then we'll get into dry forests as we get up on the cliffs. But part of the reason this um, landscape retains water so well is that um, 10,000 years ago, we were under Lake Vermont, which was 625 feet in elevation, and all these fine sediments drifted out into that cold glacial lake and filled this valley, filled the Champlain Valley, but also this area around Raven Ridge with silts and clays, and those retain water so well that they become really wonderful wetlands. If you love wildlife as I do, this is a great time to live in Vermont because 150 years ago, a lot of the species that we enjoyed were uh, just extirpated from our area. They just weren't occurring in Vermont in any number, including beavers, which have been reintroduced in the 1940s. Fishers were reintroduced. 
deer had plummeted. It was hard to find white-tailed deer in Vermont and also wild turkeys were reintroduced. So we're in kind of a flush of wildlife abundance in Vermont again and uh, it's great to go out and see what we can find, signs of them and enjoy them. Um, some things that we won't find and can't can enjoy these days are wolves and uh, catamounts because those just have never made their way back yet. But um, coyotes are here and they weren't here historically and so things have changed but there's still a lot to see. Another feature of Raven Ridge is there's some big old trees out here. We're hiking up toward the ridge. We're passing this beautiful beech tree and I looked at it carefully. I was thinking we might see signs of having a bear climate. You end up with, I'm trying to make the marks for you, but you end up with um, claw marks on opposite sides of the tree where it shimmied up there. Bears love beech nuts and they'll climb up into the top of a beech tree and they'll just pull the branches in toward them and gorge themselves, especially in the fall. And sometimes you see like this bear nest you see at the top of a beech tree where it's all been folded in on itself. So watch for the claw marks, look for the, the, the nest in the top of the tree where the bear has sat and eaten the, the nuts and uh, it'll tell you that they're, they're bear in these woods. So we're going to walk down into an orchard, which is, uh, of course, a remnant of um, the farm that this was before it became a natural area. Another thing that I notice here are these open grown hop hornbeam trees that have the large lower branches leaning out that way. So we know that this was once open. Um, there was a pasture there. And so this diversity of ages, older forest to my left, younger forest to my right, and then the orchard below us, this kind of patchiness of habitat is great for wildlife. We're standing in an old appled orchard that was part of the settlement legacy, the, the farm legacy of this natural area. But this is great for wildlife. Wildlife uh, go to apple orchards like we go to apple pie. You know, they love them. Everything from deer to bear. We see here on this tree, this tree's been marked by a bear will just look for apples throughout the fall and into the winter when they're still hanging on the trees. You know, they're good food for red fox. They'll climb up after them. You know, everything eats them really. Coyotes, turkeys, and the buds are good food for grouse. The twigs and the bark are eaten by rabbits. So there's just no end to the food that animals find in apple orchards. The trees too tend to be low growing and as the orchard is let go, there are shrubs that come up underneath it and it's good habitat then for songbirds. So it's just a, a different kind of location for animals to use in the Vermont landscape. It's not just the big wildlife like bear and deer that enjoy these apple orchards. I've been out here before in the summer and there are wasps and, and hornets that are feeding on the apples on the ground and bees. And we saw one spot where a, a hornet nest had been dug up from underground and eaten by a skunk. And so apples just give rise to so much sweetness and beauty in the landscape above them in the wildlife, uh, all the way down to the little insects. We just came from the orchard here on Raven Ridge and we saw how many things would be drawn to that part of this landscape to feed. But it turns out the Indiana bat was a critical element toward acquiring this natural area. Because of its endangered status, Fish and Wildlife contributed over half of the money that was used to purchase this natural area. We're halfway up to the ridge and we're stopping in a dry oak hickory hop hornbeam natural community. This forest is, is open grown, um, which bears on the story I'm about to tell you. Um, this habitat was of particular interest because it's great for Indiana bat, our only federally endangered Vermont mammal. And the reason is that um, the, f the females come over in the spring with their pups across the lake and they stash their pups up under the shakes of uh, trees that have exfoliating bark like the shagbark hickory and they leave them there while they go out and hunt and their preferred trees are in sunshine, open sunshine. They like having sort of an open understory to maneuver through and they particularly um, benefit from having a wetland nearby and all three of those things are happening here in the Raven Ridge natural area. 
We're in between two small ridges on the nearing the top of Raven Ridge and behind me you can see a little depression full of snow and when you think about wildlife it's important to think about the different seasons and um, the habitat that, that different animals need and here this um, little depression will fill with with meltwater it becomes a vernal pool and the wood frogs will be drawn to it like magnets. They'll come out here in the early spring as soon as it fills with water and just start quacking away, calling to each other to mate. And also salamanders will come up from underground. They spend most of their life scattered around in the woods, but they'll be drawn to this pool, sometimes in the hundreds, and come here also to mate in the spring. One of my favorites is the spotted salamander. It's a dark gray salamander about six to eight inches long that's um, covered with brilliant yellow spots and I've seen over a hundred of them in a little pool mating in the spring all tangled up together. Um, so think about amphibians and where they might live near you. We've hiked up to the ridge of Raven Ridge now and we're starting to encounter the bedrock outcrops and the talisy slopes here. And I just wanted to tell you that a few years ago I was up here and I was standing under this white oak and I saw just the ground littered with twigs. And I looked closely and they'd all been uh, clipped off um, by something much larger than a squirrel. And it turns out when I looked at the acorns and those had all been bitten in half, the white oak acorns were just chewed through that it was a porcupine. And uh, porcupines like places to den that, that have rocky uh, crevices for them to hide in. And white oak acorns are sweeter than red oak acorns. So they tend to be a preferred food for many acorn eating wildlife. We're up on the ridge now and we're in bobcat country. You can see the rock behind me is folded and fractured. And to our right, there's some caves where chunks of rock just, just slid downhill and created openings for bobcats to den in. So the bobcats come here for protection for their kittens. Um, bobcats are about twice the size of a house cat, but their kittens are about the same size as, as a house cat kittens when they first start out and they're adorable. But they also, the bobcats love being up on the ridges for the warmth. They like just to sun themselves and nap like your cat would. And they also like to smell the breeze to have it, it brings them information about predators and prey. Um, and so those are the sunny ridges, the proximity to wetlands where they can go hunt rabbits and other small mammals combined with the cliff denning sites, it just makes this excellent bobcat habitat. For that reason, the Nature Conservancy asked people to leave their dogs at home uh, on Raven Ridge. Uh, the, the area is closed from March through spring so that the cats can den in peace. But generally, it's just better um, if an area is conserved for wildlife to not have dogs running free in it because they'll chase and harass the other animals. When Raven Ridge was being assessed for conservation values about a decade ago, um, one of the key things that popped out was that it's a wildlife travel corridor. So animals like bobcats, they need to be able to connect to other large parcels. And, and Raven Ridge does connect to the south, slightly to the north, certainly also east and west down in the Champlain Valley, up into the foothills of the Green Mountains. So that was another value that was attributed to this natural area. So I was very excited one year when uh, Mike Kessler, tracker Mike Kessler, showed me that this is a bobcat scratching post. And you can see how shredded this uh, stump of a white cedar is. And I can see the pinpricks of the claw marks in it. And also when he was here, he brushed away the snow and he saw a really good bobcat track foot, the back leg footprint down to the hill. So he could imagine the cat rearing up and just sharpening its claws against this tree. These rocky cliff faces like we have at Raven Ridge are also uh, great places for birds like ravens and peregrine falcons to nest. They like that it's hard for predators to get to them. They'll nest up on ledges and just keep an eye out for things below them and above them. So it's one of the other values out here at Raven Ridge.
We've come upon the tracks of a gray squirrel and it makes me think and get excited about tracking this winter. One of the key things when you're tracking is to think that you can look at it at several levels. You can look at the track itself and count the toes and try to figure out the animal. You can look at the track pattern and then if you zoom out you can look at the habitat and certainly this is good habitat for gray squirrel. There are a lot of nut trees including multiple red oaks that we're standing under right now. We're in the oven, which is the name of this cave at the south end of Raven Ridge. And this is Moncton Quartzite arching up over me in an anticline formation. And you can see that uh, between the layers, there's been a cave formed by, by weathering. And also the cave itself was probably exposed as glaciers slid over this ridge. Uh, they tend to melt as they go up over a ridge and then pluck rocks from the south side. So that's where we are right now. Lovely spot for many, many animals. I see acorns in here that, and uh, hickory nuts that look like they've been chewed by everything from mice to squirrel to porcupines, which is our, our focal species here. Here's a, just a pile of scat, decades worth of porcupine scat. And you can see here it's kind of peanut shaped and it, of course, is fibrous. It's the, the porcupines eat wood. So they leave kind of sawdusty scat. But the other telling thing are these quills that I'm holding in my hand. Um, so porcupines use this for shelter. They mainly that then to sleep, as do some of the other animals that have uh, come here. Thank you for joining us on another Vermont Master Naturalist hike in, in the Vermont forests. Um, we have been out here looking at wildlife sign. We found an abundance of it from the beaver pond to the bobcat dens, and here we are in the porcupine cave. Go out and look at your own forest. I'm sure that you're surrounded by wild neighbors, and if you look carefully, you will find sign of them. Winter is a great time to start. The snow will lay down a track pad for you, and you can start getting to know who lives around you. Great. Thank you so much, Alicia. That really takes me right back to Raven Ridge. And if that doesn't inspire everybody to immediately leave their computer screen and, and tramp around their backyard, I'm not sure what would. <clears throat> so at this point, um, if those who are comfortable would like to um, show their video um, and we'll open it up for a bit of a discussion. We already have one question in the chat here. People can continue to put questions in the chat or like I said, use the reactions tool to raise your hand. So the first question comes from Philip Brett, and he asked, for naturalists of the past, indigenous peoples were as important to their inquiries as were plants, animals, and biogeography. Having just celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day and anticipating Judy Dow's keynote address, what are your thoughts on a naturalist relationship to the local indigenous people and their relationship to their native land? It's a, it's a really good question. And I, I think my first reaction to that is if we had all been raised in native cultures, I would be out of a job. Because truly they are the first and, and most amazing field naturalists of this landscape. And they understood it better than I ever will. And uh, I'm, I, when I get a chance to go out with someone, um, I I'll, will jump at it because I feel like there's so much to learn, not just about knowledge about the land, but a true integrated kinship relationship with the plants and animals around us that I feel like I um, feel inherently, but I kind of work to keep in focus and attain. So, um, I don't know, Philip, if you have a reaction to that or kind of what your thoughts are on that, but thank you for raising that question. 
I also noticed that Judy is, is here in the chat. I'm not sure if Judy would like to address this question. If not, save it for your keynote. I'm here. <laughs> Got to find the right button. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I agree. I think Alicia gave a very good answer. I uh, agree that their exploration experience and observation was very much a part of um, life for indigenous people of the past and for today. Um, and then it, makes, it allows people to make that, continue to make that connection with land as a relative, as kin, um, and show respect and relationships in any way they possibly can. Yeah, I guess um, that was some of my thinking as well. And one of the reasons why I raised the question is that um, I work for the Lake Champlain Basin Program and we're involved right now in a um, DEI initiative to try to get some sense of uh, what role we should play um, in this area regarding um, just such, um, you know, just the sorts of things that are related to the question I posed. Um, and I just, um, I guess one of the things that I always felt, I tend to call myself a field, uh, I tend to call myself a field biologist rather than a field uh, naturalist, simply because um, I differentiate between naturalist and um, biologist based on the fact that often naturalists have a huge amount of experience with indigenous peoples, or at least in the past they did. And as I gradually gain that um, uh, experience and knowledge, I am starting to call myself a field naturalist a bit more. Um, and so I just wanted to get your thoughts and others' thoughts on, on just you know, the question that I posed. Thank you. Thank you. It's an important one. Great. And then we have another question from Alan Clark in the chat asking uh, are any thoughts about using game cameras. Alan, would you like to elaborate on that at all? Um, basically, yeah, I've, I've started trying to use a game camera in my yard and you know, I've seen coyote and and um, porcupine and skunks and a few other things, but um, you know, I, I don't know. You know, I've, they're not always very clear pictures. Sometimes it's very discouraging, that sort of thing. And and I just don't know if there's you know any thoughts about what are the best ones, or or should I just sit in a tree all night if I want to see something with a flashlight, or what's up? <laughs> That's a great question. And, and it kind of goes back, Alan, to my introductory remark that animals are whispers of thought through forests of time. Mm -hmm. They are the most elusive element really in our landscape. It's, they're the hardest to see. I, I, I became a naturalist partly because of my intense love of animals and would love to go sit at beaver ponds and some animals allow observation more easily than others. But a lot of times for me, it's just an act of grace when an animal crosses my path. Um, I do think game cameras serve a purpose. And, and I sort of struggle with the term game camera because it, it has that inherent sort of natural resource piece in it. So sometimes we call them trail cameras or you know, okay. tracking cameras. Anyway, not, not to parse things too precisely. But when I, when I see them used in Burlington and when we use them in, in our mammal tracking project here, um, positioning them is really key, like just how, where they are, how high off the ground, you know, and there are others in this chat who probably know a lot more, like maybe, is Laura Farrell still on? Anyway, I've seen some names where people probably know this drill better even than I do, but and maybe Laura can comment. But um, well, the one thing they do for us, and I think this is what you're looking for, is they bring our landscape to life with the animals that are all around us, you know, and we can get really evocative images. There was a video taken in Centennial Woods here, right near the UVM campus of a female bobcat and her teenagers, her young of the year 
feeding on a deer carcass. And it just kind of blew my mind. Like I just, I knew they were around, I've seen their tracks, but to see them feeding right here in the heart of Burlington, you know, I mean, you can either go, wow, we still have some wildness in the city or, or my friend T O'Connor who actually had that camera out, he said he, that his reaction was animals are just super adaptable, you know, but either way, it's, it's cool to see things that live around you. And I guess I would encourage you, Alan, perhaps to think if there's a way to network in with other people near you to start okay. to um, perhaps use the data that you might be collecting to tell a bigger story of how the animals are moving in your landscape and where they're living. <clears throat> I think that kind of story is important to tell um, as right. we can serve habitat for them. Well, in the Plainfield, Marshfield area, we're quite fortunate to have a lot of incredible naturalists and, and, and our, the, our house or our yard and the surrounding yards, we quite often see a bear wow. and sometimes see bobcat. Yeah. Well, you are in magical country. <laughs> and, uh, if Laura has something to add, I would love to hear from her just about uh, good use of cameras. And I see her hand up, Matt. I don't know if you can let me. Yeah, Laura, and then Yen, if you'd like to chime in. Sure. Okay, I'm trying to find all the right buttons. <laughs> but um, I echo what Alicia said about cameras being one of the most fun ways to study the landscape because there's a lot goes on that goes on at times that we're not around. And um, it's like keeping into the hidden lives of animals. <laughs> but it's um, really rewarding too. And some of the best pictures I've seen are in the area around Raven Ridge, which is, mm -hmm. I think, a source population for bobcats. I had a camera up for a couple of years where the bobcat kittens basically grew up in front of the camera and visited it frequently. Mm -hmm. That was um, That's so cool. It was hard to take that one down. But also, Jed Murdoch has a picture of um, mm -hmm. a kill. I think they might have dragged it into an open area at Raven Ridge but they put a game camera up and there's a picture of bobcats and coyotes feeding on the same kill, which I've never seen before. Well, that's the, I mean, your, your, your nod toward the secret life of animals. There's so much that we don't know about how they behave that to, to catch some of that on video is, is enchanting. You know, it's just really like what you just described is, is amazing to, to see. It's so. a real privilege to be able to spy on them. <laughs> um, because this is an audience of a lot of Conservation Commission members, I just wanted to chime in and, and you know, mention a, a few Conservation Commissions are doing game camera, trail camera projects uh, across the state. Um, and, you know, there, there's sort of two different goals in that kind of work. And one of them is very much a public relations goal or public education goal of of making it real that animals are are in and around our community and and making it real for people that animals are crossing our roads mm -hmm. um, so there's that public relations goal and then you know for some they elevate it and and do have a, a more scientific goal of collecting data and in those sorts of projects it's very important to have a replicable methodology that you use over several seasons. So the town of Putney, the Conservation Co Commission worked for many years uh, collecting uh, uh, first tracking data uh, and then uh, game camera data um, on the, in Route 5 area. Uh, the um, <coughs> Charlotte Conservation Commission has some game cameras out under uh, uh, on, on infrastructure on Route 7, so bridges and culverts. And they're trying to get more of an idea of, of wildlife use. The Warren Conservation Commission hired Arrowwood to also do some, some game camera work. So we're really seeing it increasingly in, in our Conservation Commission work. And then in my work with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, I'm also uh, operating, working with the Agency of Transportation. And we have, I think, 124 game cameras that we have had under bridges and culverts uh, looking at wildlife usage. And uh, it's been tremendously helpful to, to go to an engineer with a picture instead of some sort of computer model and say, no, I, I, I'm not giving you any models. I'm just showing you this picture. This is real. And this, these animals are crossing under our bridges, you know, through our culverts. Uh, James Brady, when he worked for the Agency of Transportation, 
got a game camera photo of a, a fox emerging from a 320 foot dry culvert under I-89, both barrels. You know, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking, uh, but it brings me to my next point. That image tells a story. And there's an incredible story, a journey through that 320 foot uh, culvert. Uh, and, and increasingly, I want to do more of my work through talking, talking in, in story. This is something I also asked Judy Dow about, is, is talking in story and using story as a way of communicating. Could you respond to that piece, please, Alicia, and tell me more about how do you interact with story? And, and you know, whether we're talking about game cameras or, or whatever. Sure, sure. Well, I think I'm gonna put Matt on the spot. I'm gonna kick it back to Matt, because Matt, you, you were in a class with me, and I would say that's almost like a, a key theme in the way that I approach teaching and also to try to engage people in the class to approach it. So do you have any comments on how story works in that setting? Uh, my first immediate thought is I think one of the most difficult tasks I remember is we were sitting uh, on the shores of Lake Champlain at Rock Point and, and you asked us to write a story, basically like tell us, tell, tell you the story of, of that landscape. And this was one of our first classes we'd all just met and we were just kind of sitting there staring at each other and staring at this stack of literature in front of us and, and trying to, to piece it together. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't think I can speak as eloquently about this as you can, Alicia, but th that way of learning for me, um, I can I can still remember the glacial geology of the Champlain Valley because of the way that, that we learned it hands-on and, and we were told this story from the ground up. I just think that you can read as many peer-reviewed papers, look at as many graphs as you like, but till you see it and understand it and you're able to to tell the story yourself and mm -hmm. I think that that just really fosters a, a deeper connection and one quick thing while we're still on the, the game cameras I feel like I must make a plug for the ABCC tiny grants program in the spring through our tiny grants program we've been been able to fund some conservation commissions purchasing uh, game cameras so that's an opportunity if your CC is thinking about uh, a trail camera project and um, you're in need of some funds, keep an eye out for that. But I'll, I'll kick it back to the stories and, and Alicia, please please elaborate and cover any gaps that I missed. <laughs> no, that, that was good to know. And I, I think what I thought of as you were talking, Matt, is, and I'm paraphrasing this, but Albert Einstein once said, if you think you understand someone, explain it to a six-year-old. You know, and it really is hard to tell a good story, and it's hard to tell it clearly. And but but as you practice that, um, it's a real tool and a gift and a way to engage people that I think um, is a great thing to refine. Um, and uh, I will say, when I look at these videos, I'll just as a full full disclosure. I wince a little bit when I watch them because like even saying that Lake Champlain covered the Champlain Valley 10,000 years ago, I really rounded that number. I kind of put the whole glacial era about 10,000 years ago, but really the lake was here more like 13,000 years ago. But I just, even in the moment, I could see myself making that call to just like ballpark it, you know, and I, and then later, I mean, I, I feel like I wrestle with this engaging storytelling and not getting people too caught up in the details of it versus profound accuracy. So it's, it's, a, it's a constant uh, dialogue in my own head uh, about that. And I tend to err on the side of telling a good story, <laughs> you know, but, but I don't want to mislead people either. So it, I'll just put it out there. I guess I'm curious if anyone else on the call struggles with telling stories and also trying to be scientific or accurate, you know, in, or, you know, true to things. Um, I don't so much struggle with storytelling as I do with understanding there are several ways of storytelling. Um, <clears throat> when you go through school, you tend to learn there's a beginning, middle and end 
to a story and occasionally there's a beginning, a climax and a solution, right? <laughs> Uh-huh. But in native storytelling, there's a beginning and it spirals around in many stories and comes back to the beginning again. And with something like a photograph from a trail camera, that gives you the opportunity to tell this story full circle, mm-hmm. to come back around. And um, <clears throat> this year I had trouble with someone stealing my mailbox and I called the police and they're like, yeah, we're not going to sit there, put a trail camera up. So I went out and got a trail camera, I put it up. And not only did I see who stole my mailbox, because they came back to steal it again a couple nights later, but um, I also realized that my driveway was a trail for the deer to use every night and 17 deer were walking down my driveway every night. (laughs) So it was just one of those little spirals in the circle of the story. Wow, the guy who stole my mailbox. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I think uh, a narrative is an, is an amazing way to teach children. And it's, um, and the photographs give you the not- uh, mnemonic device you need to get them to tell you a story. What, what do you think you ha- happened here? What do you, what do you, what would you predict? And then you can give the actual story. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's a great way of illustrating the cyclical nature that you talked about in your opening address, too. That's really, really helpful. Um, and I think this question could go to Judy and Alicia as well. So does the pot of courage ask about balancing stories with regulatory requirements um, as towns and other groups begin to develop recreational use areas? especially trail systems, how do we encourage them to consider areas that should be avoided? Wow. <laughs> that's, that's a courageous question. It really is. I mean, that is, I think, the question is, um, and it's hard. And I, I don't know, Judy, I would love your perspective on this as well. But um, Zapata, I would say that one of the things I struggle with is we admire and and hope to emulate um, people like Judy and her ancestors and people who've lived here is there just a lot more of us now and so it's we can't all go everywhere and do everything Um, and so it's, it's that balance of when do we give animals space and and plants room to spread themselves and and have different habitats. I mean, I think one of the things that's been striking to me working in conservation is you sort of draw a circle around where the rare plants are, but they don't stay there, you know? So it's not like you can conserve that one little patch of cliff and you're gonna have this rare cliff break forever. It needs room to move, they move around, you know? So I- anyway, I, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question, but I do have that concern that, um, conservation, I think, includes sometimes putting nature first. Um, so I'd, I'd love anyone's response to that. Um, a storyteller has an awesome responsibility um, because once you put your words out there, they're out there and you don't know what child, what person is gonna pick up your words and go forward with it. Um, So you have, number one, you have that responsibility um, when you tell the story to to try to get the story out there as factual or as um, imaginative, whatever it is you want to get it out there, you have to make that clear um, as a, as a narrative of the uh, na- narrator of the story, um, but but it also um, I have done many times uh, a narrative of an archaeological site that has ended up in an archaeological report, and just now um, we've been working with the land trust um, to tell the story of this land where. Uh, the Millbrook River is um, changing route. And it's 
uh, eroding terribly. And they're like, well, normally native people would just um, say this is a natural occurrence. If it erodes this, this site, it's not a problem. But for me, this particular site is a problem because the narrative of every right angle of that meandering river has been caused because of the influence of a person. So the person dumped rock or riprap or something in the location to create a right angle. So they purposely increased their farmland to redirect the river into wasteland and wash out a historical site. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not okay with that. And so I'm working on a narrative again for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important to get the narrative out there, no matter what the story is, um, because not everybody, you know, learns orally or visually. And I think a written form of whatever the story is, is, is equally as important. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thank you, Judy. I, I almost, Matt, would love to hear that question again, and maybe even ask if, he could elaborate on it a little bit because I think it's a really um, important topic. So Zapata was asking about balancing stories with regulatory requirements and uh, said, as towns and other groups begin to develop recreational use areas, especially trail systems, how do we encourage them to consider areas that should be avoided? Mm -hmm. Do you have more to say on that, Zapata? He's still on. Hi, Alicia. Um, I may have a delay. I've got poor internet connection, but thank you. This was this was great. Uh, so I'm a district wetland ecologist for the state of Vermont, and obviously they're they are protected by the state. And as municipalities and other groups um, are really reaching into the recreational world, um, in COVID has exacerbated that. Um, development of trail systems has exploded. Uh, mm -hmm. And so part of the concerns in Raven Ridge is, is also one of them is that in a given area, there may be sensitive spaces, whether it's uh, wildlife like the bobcat denning site um, or wetland areas or a rare threatened or endangered plant. And so how do we, um, whether it's our conservation commissions working with our towns or regulatory people like myself, develop a narrative or story to impart the importance of these areas that, that while they might offer unique viewing or experience, they really should be avoided because of the sensitive nature that they are. That's such, you do that, I, I get your, I get your point and it's really important. And I, I guess um, I'll address Raven Ridge. I was really happy that um, the Nature Conservancy closes the ridge during bobcat season. And I think they do a certain amount of checking on that. Um, but the hope is, and I think no one anticipated the COVID surge into natural areas. Um, and they do consider Raven Ridge a flagship Recre you know, area, they were encouraging people to visit it at the time, for instance, that I made that film, you know, but I, I share your concern that things can get overpopularized and that trails go in that may or may not be sanctioned, you know, they may be um, establishing a clear trail system or they may be just being thrown up in the woods because people want to recreate. And, and that's, that's an, it's an increasing challenge, it really is. And I guess from my perspective, just to not back down, to show up when you can and tell the stories that you know about these unusual places. I did have a good experience with that in Burlington and I would love to email with you later if you wanna know more about that. But, but, but having sort of the stakeholders in a particular group agree that the ecology was critical that allowed the process to unfold down a better path. So uh, it's really important to just keep bringing the plants and animals to the table. And, and the more specifics you have, and as, as um, 
Jens was suggesting, the more photos you have, uh, the more effective that can be. Judy, did you have anything else to add to that? Uh, sure. <laughs> the only thing I would add to that is the <clears throat> in her um, comment in the chat box, she talks about landscape. And landscape is an art word that was created or invented to talk about how you make the land, how you shape the land. And so um, typically when I'm thinking of the land, I talk about the land. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm talking about the landscape, I'm talking about how someone has shaped it to be that way. And so for me, I see a distinct difference between land and landscape. And when you look out in the big world, uh, landscape is used by landscapers and land architects and everybody who is, or landscape architects, everybody who's shaping the land. So I just wanted to make a little note there that some people see it differently. Thank you for sharing that distinction with us. I think that's really important for us all to hear. Um, so there's another comment in the chat from Philip Brett um, saying that our director shared an article by a scientist with a Native American background. She called it, I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but two-eyed seeing. And uh, Philip is in the process of developing his ability for two-eyed seeing. Philip, do you want to talk more about that or does anybody else want to chime in there? Well, I was just uh, wondering if uh, Judy may have heard of that particular article, but it's, it comes from a Mi'kmaq word that basically means the ability to, to see in two different ways or even more than two different ways. Um, and so um, Alicia was mentioning um, the complexities of um, trying to be precise in a scientific way and yet be able to tell a good story uh, as to what is going on or, or uh, an educational story as to what is going on in the, in the environment that we're looking at. And uh, that's just, um, it kind of applies to that because uh, the article was talking about, you know, the, the need for, you know, scientific precision in some cases, and also the need to really listen to the indigenous peoples of a particular area and the way they had managed the natural resource and how they work with the natural resource. And I was just thinking of that particular article when Alicia was talking about those two needs that come side by side, the need to be able to educate and tell a story about the land and then also to be able to um, apply scientific principles and they aren't two you know they aren't two separate things or two antithetical things they can be thought of together and worked together and just my thoughts Great. Well, th thanks for that, Philip. Um, so we do have uh, five more minutes, and I'm just wondering if there are other directions we want to take this conversation and, uh, and what folks are thinking about. Um, I'd, li I'd like to ask Alicia a question. Alicia, I really liked your presentation. Thank you. Um, I've done research for years on um, the families targeted by the eugenics records and they have traveled. Um, I've documented their travels on specific trails across the lake and over the land. And um, in all cases, their travels are very old ancestral land trails or water trails that can date back to um, late woodland periods. Do you find that with the animals? <laughs> what a great, great question. 
and uh, I I will answer immediately yes. And and the story I have that I like best, and it's not Vermont centered, but I had the pleasure of visiting Glacier Bay um, 20, 30 years ago. And it was not as well used then, so I don't know if this would still be surviving. But Judy, the bear trails there, they're the, the spruce and fir, are there. it's very wet. Um, and there's moss that grows up in where the herb layer would be. And it's very deep. And the bear trails were individual bear footprints that were very deep going through these mossy forests. And you could see that the bears were using them again and again and again. You know, they weren't like, tr they weren't like trampled trails. They were like actual footprints through the forest, which I thought was pretty amazing. Kind of gives me chills that there is that memory and there is that knowledge. And so back to the bobcats in Centennial Woods, um, you know, we're starting to limit the places that animals can hang out and live and, and they're going to adapt. And I've seen a red fox here in my South End neighborhood in Burlington and they can get by. But I would love, going back to Zapata's question, I would love for there to be natural areas where the animals can behave as animals and they're not having to um, adapt quite so strongly to the pressures that roads and other things and housings, you know, puts on them because I think they do have this cultural memory uh, yeah. that they retain and that it'd be nice if it, if we could allow them to have that. Do you see in the, in this world of land fragmentation, do you see uh, a way to connect Centennial Field in the interval? Um, they're actually, are some ways, and I would love to chat with you more about that, and Laura would have some ideas about this too, but that is one of the things that we're trying to really think hard about here in Burlington, is not just protecting our intact, um, sustainable forests that seem to be doing pretty well, and we have a, a, a gift of having several of those, those core areas that seem like they're retaining their natural communities and their understory. Um, but we'd like to do what you're suggesting, Judy, which is really think long term about how to reforest parts of our landscape, how to turn parts of people's yards, you know, into habitat, um, how to keep those connections going. I wish we knew in each case what the moose and the bear and other things might have been thinking, you know, as they travel through Burlington and probably moose because of the high temperatures in the summer never hung out here. You know, we were probably always where the young went to look for mates and find territory. But um, that said, I have talked to a tracker and he believes that when a moose comes into Burlington that often you see it doing the same kind of route through weird places in town. And he wonders if it is that ancestral memory of, of travel um, through our landscape. So it's a great provocative question that I think must have a million amazing stories attached to it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I suspect it is as well because every once in a while they'll wander through our area and our area isn't too far away from wetlands in the north end of Burlington where they would have found um, food or other resources that they were looking for and so I, I, I have always suspected the same. Well, that's a nice note to end on, Jens. Um, yeah. I guess the only last thing I would say, and unless I'll let you actually do the official closing, but <laughs> I, I did want to say there are other videos um, on the Vermont Master Naturalist YouTube channel. If you'd like to go on more hikes with me, I'd love to have you join me in the woods. Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Alicia, thank you so much. That was really excellent. We, I, I enjoyed that thoroughly and the conversation was lovely, uh, really thought provoking. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, this was our fourth and final regular lunchtime uh, webinar series uh, as part of our uh, conservation summit, Caring for the Land. Next week, uh, Judy Dow it will be offering her closing remarks for our keynote address, and that's the 20th of October at 7 o'clock at night. 
That uh, meeting is also our, our business meeting for the Association of Vermont Conservation Commissions. Uh, we don't have a lot of business, uh, but we do have an election we need to do. Uh, so we'll be doing that um, and, and giving you a status update of the organization uh, before Judy's remarks. Um, so thank you all so much. Alicia, thank you again. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the conversation next week. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.